Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, market historian Bob Hoy, the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com, will run down the major markets. He'll take a look at gold, crude, the U.S., and Canadian dollars. Bob will also answer some listener questions about market trends, whether Canada will soon have higher interest rates than the U.S. to protect the Canuck buck, will China suffer the same economic fate as 1980s Japan, and could we be in for a depression? CEO of InsideTrackTrading.com, Eric Haddock, examines the cycles that appear to affect gold, silver, interest rates, and the stock markets, and how it could all be connected to the 11.2-year solar cycle. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from the Director of Marketing for Recyclico, Tony Mitchell. We'll talk to Bob Hoy right after this. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. He's speaking to us from Vancouver. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Hi, Jim. How good to be with you. Bob, uh, how would you describe what happened in the stock markets this week? Well, it was sort of choppy, and, and, uh, but things going on within it. You know, like the S&P was gaining on the week, but the bond future was declining on the week. Uh, the last few days, the Canadian dollar was recovering a little. It's nice to see that. At the same time, as U.S. dollars firmer, so, uh, but the, the Toronto, uh, stock exchange was sort of sideways on the week, and we're always interested in crude oil, and it had a very nice high a week ago, and it's, uh, it's a modest correction from there, and the, uh, the TSE base metal miners have been very good, like copper stocks, that sort of stuff, but they kind of got overdone on the upside and have corrected for the last couple of days and gold stocks are <laughs> are are up to a strong high they the sector's been acting well could you know always going to correct and stuff like that and short dated interest rates they still remain high so it's a uh, it's a mixed world out there now Bob, uh, can we uh, take a look at some listener questions? Oh, yeah. We always like those. Okay. Our first question comes from Chris. Bob, I recall a few years back a podcast where you told a story of a broker placing his client's money in junior miners at the right time. I recall one client, uh, to show appreciation, bought the broker a Studebaker car. I couldn't recall the podcast, but... Perhaps Bob retell that story again. One of my favorites. Yeah. In the early 70s, I was in a brokerage in downtown Vancouver, and one of the great promoters in history, uh, I think he was from the Atlantic provinces, can't think of his name now, but he was there promoting a stock. And he had an elderly gentleman there, to kind of warm up the audience for this great promoter. And he was smart, very dapper, dressed in, in a uh, double-breasted uh, gray flannel suit, just very smart. And he was there, as I said, to warm up the audience. So afterwards, I, uh, we were all just chatting and whatnot, and I, I, talk, I made a point of talking with him. And I said, you've been in the markets for a long time. He says, oh, yeah. I said, you were in Montreal back when it was a very speculative market? And he says, yeah. I said, how about the uh, the gold boom 
in the early 1930s, and he looks at me in the eye and he says, Sonny, it was so good that one of my best customers bought me a brand new 1933 Ford Roadster as a gratuity. Now, how's that? Wow, can you imagine what that car would be worth today? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Also, I've seen that car around for decades, hmm. and the 34 and 30, 33 and 34 Ford Roadsters are very nice. Now, we have a question from our friend Michael. Hi, Bob. Today you're able to get five and a quarter percent interest with three month U.S. Treasury bills. If the markets take a substantial decline, that five and a quarter rate would most likely also decline. How long term or, or corporate bonds perform in that time or in that type of environment? Yeah. Well, you're right on, uh, Michael, on that short term rates. The next move for those is down. And they, they've been high, uh, they had a slightly higher high in, in, in August, came down a bit, and then have risen a bit here. So I'm watching for them to roll over and start a decline, uh, just because I like watching them. And, uh, but yeah, they could ultimately go to zero. So you don't want to be in short-term deposits. So, and yet if you're, out in the long end, long dated government of Canada's, or as we used to call them, dominions, or uh, long dated treasuries in the states, uh, not it's that's very risky. So, what we've done is designed a little portfolio <laughs> portfolio for income investor, and it would be uh, a few. Uh, you got to go to a good bond trading desk. And then buy, find some good grade U.S. corporate bonds of a three to four year maturity, and they will be matured at par. Uh, you'll get a better income from short dated stuff, and then uh, probably uh, uh, pick up on Canadian dollar going down relative to U.S. For Canadians, I really like that as an investment position. But if you go out, you don't want to go out too far. Three to four years, they'll be redeemed at par. Uh, eh, I think that's a nice position. We'll have more with Bob Hoy as we take a look at more questions right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Bob, a listener question. Do you think the stock markets are likely heading higher? They've been pretty good since last fall. Uh, we had a terrific rush into, well, I thought, first of all, to January. We got to January and said there was more to it, and that sort of made it to the to uh, March 28th, if I recall rightly, for the S&P, and then it's corrected. I think it can go sideways for a while, but the problem in taking a longer look at this is that after mid-year, if something's going to go wrong with the financial markets, it'll go wrong beginning then. So uh, we like this. The strength was very good, and some sectors were almost on fire. So the advice is to build some liquidity, uh, you know, for a rainy day on we, the rallies. We keep hearing 2500 3000 5000 maybe 10000 an ounce for gold. What do you see ahead for the precious metal? Yeah, this is tricky because, Jim, one of the key characteristics, we, we have been in a great financial bubble. And it's over as of last January uh, 2022, essentially. Uh, Now, in that time, post-bubble period, the uh, 
I look at the real price of gold. You deflate it by the CPI, and then I've had been more fun with it by deflating it by uh, the CRB, the Commodity Index representing mining costs. So if the mining costs are falling relative to bullion price, uh, the miners are making money. Now, this has been going on since last October. So the miners are getting a boost from their costs uh, not flying up. So now, when you start talking in U.S. dollars, about 3,000 or 10,000 an ounce gold, there is no rational way of making that call. It's all intuition. And so what I'm going to leave with our readers is that the real price is going up. Gold mining stocks are early stages in a long bull market that will at times be really exciting. And uh, forget about these uh, crazy uh, estimates of 10,000. Uh, that's, that's just old 1960s way of looking at gold. And the only way the, this school of thought can come up with things is that they assume that the U.S. dollar is going to go to zero. But then you got the problem that in a post-bubble environment, one of the features is the senior index becoming chronically firm, which it has been, like it was 106 here recently, uh, the DX. So, yeah, okay. Next question. Do you think it will be sell in May and go away for the gold miners? Uh no, I think they had a strong peak a little while ago, and I think the I, I think the gold mining stocks will go sideways through to mid year at least. So, yeah. What's copper telling us? Copper uh, really had a terrific rally. The copper stocks, whoo, they were fantastic. Now they became really overbought a few weeks ago and have corrected. Now seasonally on copper. The metal itself, you can have a nice high in March, and then there's another seasonal rally into July. So, uh, and then, of course, there's always the dismal lows in November. So, uh, probably the base metal sector will probably be okay through to mid-year. But I, the, big, the biggest gains have made already. I don't know how far they're going to go into mid-year. How are the copper miners doing? We covered that. How's crude looking? Crude, uh, oh yeah, it's got uh, it's it's been a fairly good price. It's corrected, and I think crude can kind of go sideways here through through to mid year. And then we always recall that crude oil sometimes in September can have a good month. And then if you look for the last few years, it's, it's always been a dismal low for crude oil at around December, January. So that's our view on crude oil. What tends to happen when crude oil markets peak? Uh, the uh, go, the um, oil stocks peak with it, whereas um, in base metals, if you get a peak in, in, in copper, usually it's lead by some weeks by the base metal stocks. They have an ability to anticipate that. So uh, Canadian dollar looking bullish? No, not really. It's just in a, a long downtrend. The federal government is a disaster, and they're really messing up the economy. Investments are not coming in. They shut down as best they could the oil and gas business and they're messing around with agriculture all of a sudden trudeau doesn't like uh, nitrogen so it takes a shot at agriculture so and unfortunately the trudeau government will be around uh, probably until is it november 25 when there's an uh, election yeah yeah one time has to be called yeah is the U.S. dollar bullish? Oh, in the long term, very bullish, yes. And it's bullish lately. Uh, yeah, it's one of the worst. The street cannot explain the recently firming U.S. dollar. 
but it's something it's got to do some more studying on. And one of the, as I said, one of the features of a post-bubble contraction is the senior currency becomes chronically firm. In Canada, could interest rates go higher than the U.S. to support the Canadian dollar? Well, typically they're higher than the U.S. anyways. Hmm. It's because the um, the market for Canada, long-dated Canada bonds, is, is much thinner than the equivalent uh, treasuries in the U.S. And uh, so, uh, yeah, as long as I can remember, Canadian rates have been higher than U.S. How do interest rate bull markets historically compare to today's rising interest rates? Oh, yeah. Now, as I've mentioned, we're past the climax of a great financial bubble. And there are four main features. And one we've talked about is that the senior currency becomes chronically firm, correct. And then the other is that real adjusted for inflation, long interest rates go up. Yes, they've come from less than 1% to about 2.5%. It's been painful so far. But the typical increase has been a, a very damaging 10 percentage points. That's ahead of us. And then the other is that uh, gold's real price goes up. That's in line. And uh, base metal prices, the real adjusted for inflation, they go down. So everything that was happening in the bubble rolls over and goes the other way. We're hearing detached home sales are currently at multi-decade lows in the greater Vancouver area. Does today's home market mirror previous home uh, markets? And using those previous markets, what is likely ahead for real estate? Yeah, I think the did one last November on real estate in U.S. and Canada, and uh, it looked like residential was peaking. Uh, also in Toronto and Vancouver, Toronto and Vancouver have been exceptional because of the Asian bid, but nonetheless, we passed the highs. Now, the other one I came up with was farmland values in Ontario, and they were just as wild and speculative as was, say, residential in Toronto. Now, the only historical one I've got is uh, farmland values in England plotted monthly from the Great Boom in 1873 to the Depression Bottom 1895. Uh, just off my memory, I think that index went from 58 down to 38. So that was farmland values. Now, here in Vancouver, I remember with the big peak of inflation and crude oil in, in 1980, and everything was hot as hell. The real estate market in Vancouver was really strong, and then it got hit hard. Um, British Properties, which is kind of expense account living, and high mortgages and stuff like that, they fell to one-third. I'm going to say that again. Not off by a third, but to one-third of the high. In Toronto, a high-end house in Rosedale, a high-end place, uh, was seized by a trust company for some reason or other, and Financial Post wrote it up every once in a while, and I recall that that one, by the time they got it sold, it was one-third of the high that it was on the books at. So now, on uh, like residential in a nice but modest area in Caresdale after 1980, fell in half. So residential prices in Vancouver are way overpriced and are likely and may have peaked and are likely to have quite a lengthy correction. In the late 80s, Japan was buying up the world. Fast forward, China's been buying up the world since then. Is China likely to see the same fate as Japan? Oh, yeah, the late 80s. That boomed to... The Nikkei peaked on the last trading day of 1989, but that was a Japan boom where not much else was going on elsewhere. So the Japanese players, there was some kind of a warrant 
financing thing where they essentially were getting cost-free money for speculating, and the sky was the limit. Uh, I remember a story about a guy in the summer, maybe 89, buying the whole damn Pebble Beach Golf Club, you know, down at Monterey. And that would be a high-ticket item. And then by the fall, late fall, he was forced out on a big margin call. So I think he lost something like $500 million. Now, that's that's more than you, on a, on a per-hole basis, that's very expensive golf, isn't it? Hmm. And, of course, take a look at China right now. Their real estate is collapsing left, right, and center. Oh, yeah. it's all China's already over. But there was another one in, Japan, in Tokyo. I think one block, one square block, was worth more than all of the, uh, the real estate in the United States. I mean, it, it, it's, it was really bizarre. So... Yeah, and then the question is, China like to see the same fate as Japan? Yeah, China, China had a bubble, essentially, with inexperienced people coming at the end, and also maybe the movers and shakers at the top. If they haven't been through the, say, the 1980 crash, they don't really know what's going on. They All they know is up and how to manipulate it. So uh, there's going to be some... Mother Nature is going to provide some severe lessons. And, of course, China as well is becoming uh, militarily kind of aggressive. Uh, a lot of patrols between the mainland yeah. and Taiwan uh, using fire hoses on Filipino uh, fishing boats yeah. and so on. Yeah. Well, I think uh, as the Ch- uh, China real estate and economy and investors get worse off, China will try and create a diversion of some kind. Yeah, uh, like Argentina invading the Falklands when their economy yeah. collapsed back yeah. in the eighties. Yeah. Now they say history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Could we be on deck for a depression? Yeah, I've used the term uh, "post bubble contraction." It doesn't upset people too much, but in the last few months. I've been actually calling that there is the potential for a depression. This, the, the credit markets have been so stretched. And as I say, with our four main features, uh, it to me, they're saying that we're on track for a severe contraction. And then sometime... It'll be bad. Now, what's the old saying? It's a recession if you're still um, uh, employed, and if you're unemployed, it's a depression. Hmm. Is gold a protection against something like that? Oh, yeah. Gold bullion itself is a, is a, har- a safe harbor. And as we've covered, uh, the gold stocks, will, if the S&P takes a 30% hit, the gold stocks are going to get hit. So you want to be... Uh, not buying gold stocks now, but on the next weakness, maybe later, uh, maybe in the fall or something like that. So, yeah. Uh, getting back to Canada's energy policy, we're having the Trans Mountain Pipeline come online. They're going to be shipping oil straight to China or Japan. We could yeah. be shipping natural gas. And uh, Stuart Muir, friend of the show, pointed out once, one natural gas tanker has over $100 million worth of product on it. That's impressive. I didn't know the number. Yeah. Wow. Well, they, there could have been, without the Trudeau government, there would have been much more facilities in Canada to export, export natural gas. And it should be. It is an, it's an outstanding fuel. Yes, uh, Carol Taylor, BC's former finance minister and uh, a national television personality in Canada, she told me when she was finance minister she had nightmares about the price of natural gas going up or down a penny because Uh it meant millions of dollars to the provincial treasury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so for governments not to be looking at uh, something like that. I think the energy source should be natural gas, of course, ideally hydropower, but hey, you, you've got to be an exceptional place to have that. But otherwise, nuclear power. They've now got these modular nuclear plants where they don't have to be the huge mothers that take 10 years to build. 
these are more modest, and then they're modular, so you can add to capacity if you need it, and you can build them not that far away from the users of electricity, so then you don't have, you know, uh, power lines going for, uh, you know, a thousand miles or something like that. So, no, the energy uh, world uh, over the next decade can get a whole lot more practical. As I said, natural gas and uranium, Mm. or nuclear power, yeah. Yes. Now, uh, some people thought about using a, a helium reactor, which means uh, the byproduct isn't radioactive. <laughs> <laughs> but well, uh, actually, you mentioned helium, yeah. and it, I saw a little video the other day of a guy, uh, a hiker with a oh, reasonable sized backpack. You know, this was not an overnighter, but he also he had a good strong balloon about maybe three feet across, and it was full of helium. And there was so much helium that it, it, he, he could take his pack off, secure it to the string from the helium bloom, and it would hold it up. So his idea was he put his pack on, had the helium balloon lifting, carrying the weight up the hill. I thought that was the brightest thing i ever seen. Yeah, uh, and of course scientists say we're wasting it on birth, birthday balloons when you need it for things like uh, cancer treatments. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. always a spoil sport somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah. Bob, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Yeah, Jim, good to be with you and look forward to next week. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. Bob loves to answer your questions. You can send them to info at howstreet.com. Coming up, Eric Haddock, next on This Week in Money. Recyclical, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Eric Haddock, CEO and President of InsideTrackTrading.com. He's speaking to us from Central California. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Well, thanks for having me back, Jim. Last month, we revisited your approach to the natural year and the first month of that year. Can you explain its significance and update what we discussed last month? Yeah, well, one of the things I do, an approach that I take with the markets, is looking at a little bit of an offset year Um based on something that's, uh, you know, thousands of years old. Uh, is It was always watched in agricultural-based societies, is part of astronomy and astrology, <clears throat> and that is a year that begins with the vernal equinox of, of one year and flows through to the vernal equinox of the uh, ensuing year. And for me... What I watch most closely is the first month of that year. So basically from about March 20th to April 19th, 20th, it's a type of opening range for the year, for that natural year. And when I mention an opening range, an opening range is something that's been watched very closely in a lot of trading for decades uh, back in the 80s and 90s, you had a very popular trading approach. Um, I'm not sure how much it's used nowadays or not, especially with 24-hour trading is kind of uh, messed with that a little bit. But it was called market profile, and and the trading day, a lot of the emphasis was on the opening range. And there's many reasons for that. One is that there's a lot of information distilled going into that time period. 
And even on broader time frames, it's a similar thing. When you get to the uh, opening range of the week, well, you've had a couple days of weekend events and analysis to be distilled and disseminated. And so the initial trading for that week often reveals a lot about what you can expect for the entirety of that week. And I look at the same thing on a yearly basis. So getting back to that subject of the natural year, that first 30 days is often very significant. And you can go back throughout history and see that there was a lot of um, activity, a lot of change during that time frame. In the Northern Hemisphere, it's, it's really when, you know, cultures and, and tribes and whatnot came out of a wintering type of mentality. Uh, there's even verses throughout the Old Testament that talk about this time of year when kings went off to war. And you've seen it in our own society. You know, when did uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine really uh, take place? right in the beginning of March, but it really kind of kicked up there in that same time frame. So that opening range is very critical to me, and often you will see uh, significant shifts and significant moves in that first 30 days. And and so that's a, um, again, it's a harbinger of, of what you can expect throughout the entire natural year. And there's there's other reasons for it. I, I go a little more in depth into it in some of my publications that explain it. But it's, it's something that I think really needs to be paid close attention to and, and used throughout the year. And that becomes even more significant, more prevalent when you're dealing with any sort of commodity market where the natural year does have an an even stronger impact on growing cycles, supply demand cycles, carryover stock cycles. And, and some of that even flows through into your financial markets. When you discuss an opening range, how do you use that moving forward? Well, one of the things, that I do, and and like I said, I look for some significant moves and shifts during the opening range, and this year there were a lot of corroborating cycles in markets like stock indexes. It's why I explained I thought we would see a sharp sell-off from uh, the, the final week of March into right around that April 19th time frame. Uh, inversely, you had gold, silver, precious metals going into when my work was showing there should be an acceleration phase to the upside from that late March into April 19th time frame. So that's the first thing that I look at where an opening range is concerned. There are certain times, certain years when a lot of corroborating cycles will be telling you to look for significant moves. But the second application, which is sometimes more significant, is I use that opening range on a daily, weekly, monthly, and in this case, yearly basis as a gauge of trend and subsequently as critical support or resistance for that trend. Let me just unpack that a little bit. You, you get the opening range set. So in this case, we're talking about the opening range of the natural year, that time frame between about March 20th and April 19th. That sets the range. Then you look for a market to close outside of that range. And since we're talking about a, a 12-month uh, range, 12-month time frame, you'd want at least a weekly close uh, beyond that range, and ultimately a a monthly close to confirm it. But once you get a weekly close either above the high of that range or below the low of that range, you've identified the initial trend for that time period. 
And once that has happened, if you if you close above the high of that range, that high, that breakout point becomes support for the subsequent weeks and months. Once a market rallies, you will often see it pull back and kind of retest that breakout point and assess just how strong of a support level it is. But it helps to identify what the prevailing trend is for that time period and what you can expect at least for the first half of that time frame. And that gets into some other rules and other principles that I use with with trends on time frames like that. But so it's it's a time frame. The opening range is something to first look for some significant shifts and moves and then secondarily to as a gauge for the trend moving forward. Stocks drop precisely into that April 19th date. What does that reveal about the coming months? Well, last month and in several of my publications in mid to late March, I was explaining how many of the uh, stock indexes were showing signs of a multi-month top. You had already even generated some sell signals in mid-March in a couple of them. And then there were some remaining indexes, the S&P 500, the S&P mid-cap 400, that were showing uh, they had multi-week and multi-month cycles peaking in at the very end of March. And all of my work was showing that we should see an initial plunge or sell-off into uh, the, the days right around that April 19th. There were a lot of reinforcing cycles that had nothing to do with that uh, opening range of the natural year. And so they had a high level of non-correlation, which is an important thing to look for when you're assessing synergy of, of indicators or of cycles that if you've got multiple factors coming from a little bit different origins, a little bit different perspectives, and yet they're still concluding the same thing, it's a higher, it gives me a higher level of, of credibility and confidence in those, in this case, cycles. And so the, the trend indicators and the uh, price indicators that I use that triggered some sell signals towards the end of March, uh, they were all showing that it should be a, an initial drop into April 19th. There were, as I just said, there were a lot of other daily cycles coming into play that said we should see an initial low right within a day or two of April 19th. But in the process, uh, many of the stock indexes did exactly what I'd be looking for during an initial sell-off like that, and that is on April 19th, uh, three of the key indexes I watch, uh, S&P 500, the Russell 2000, and the S&P mid-cap, all turned their weekly trend indicator down. That is a lagging, confirming indicator that I use. It's not what triggers my initial sell signals, but it's what confirms them and signals that they are a higher magnitude uh, trend reversal. And so what you will often get, and I, in fact, I even sent out an alert to my subscribers yesterday, reiterating and, and elaborating on this principle and on this uh, indicator. But what you will get is that reversal signal often coincides with an initial low. So you have the daily sell signal triggered in, in late March. The markets start moving down. And now I look for the weekly trend uh, lagging indicator to kick in right around the culmination of that first sell-off. And that is exactly what we had happen on April 19th. So that told me two things. One was that uh, we have confirmed a higher magnitude top back in March and, and sell signal and decline.
but simultaneously you're identifying a likely time for the initial low, then you look for a bit of a reactive bounce. A couple other indicators usually pinpoint where that bounce should peak at, and then that weekly trend reversal tells me that we should see a second sell-off beginning a couple weeks later. That all reinforces what I've been saying for a few months is that the time frame between late March and late May would be a very vulnerable one for stocks, that we would likely see a couple of significant sell-offs. Uh, you could even get some, some breakdown of key one- to two-year support levels during that sell-off. So by turning that weekly trend down last Friday, you further validated that intermediate, that multi-month analysis, and it just told me to look for an initial low, a brief bounce, and then another sell-off in the month of May. It could take us down to some extreme targets that I have on the downside for a lot of these indexes. I was also explaining uh, back in March, how one of the real lead stocks, I just call them kind of proxy stocks, that um, their action and their technical movement uh, is a little bit of a proxy for the overall indexes. But the last surge in stocks was really led by your AI-related uh, stocks, um, NVIDIA being one of them. And and that stock, NVDA, had extreme upside targets in my work around 950. And it spiked up to there in early March. Uh, In mid-March, I discussed why it had some daily cycles where you could still see another rebound into March 25th. And from there, it should see a... um, a pretty significant drop. First level of support was down around 760, 770, but there's even lower levels that could be uh, attacked if we break through that 760, 770 level. So you even had individual stocks like that. There were several others giving similar signals and warnings that we were entering this, this tenuous time in equity markets. And I think there's a couple other factors that are just beginning to um, appear on the horizon that could uh, shake up the market in the coming weeks. At the same time, gold and silver surged into April 19th with both reaching your upside targets. Is that the end of the rally or just a pause? I still believe that that's just one of the phases when my work was triggering these buy signals back in mid-February in gold and silver and then in late February in the related mining indexes, mining share indexes like the XAU and the HUI, it all was telling me to look for a, a multi-month surge. Uh, the first upside target I had for gold was up around 2320 in the June futures contract is what I'm, I'm watching. And in silver up above $27 in the May contract, that was a, um, a one to two month target. And the one to three month target was up at 2430 to 2445 in gold and right around $30 in silver. And both of those metals surged up to those levels, uh, first into April 12th, then they pulled back a little bit, and then rallied into their highest daily closes on April 19th, further reinforcing and affirming that that time frame, that opening range of the natural year, uh, that, that time when you often see increased uncertainty in the markets, increased conflict in and out of the markets. And that was the next stage of my overall outlook for gold and silver. But I still think that there is one and possibly two 
uh, significant advances still yet to unfold this year. And, and they could be, um, complete before the end of the third quarter of this year. So for me, there still is some, some decent upside potential in gold and silver. There's a couple of key time frames when you are more likely to see accelerated moves. Uh, just like what I was discussing in, in late March, early April. And we could see surges up to the, um, the three to six month upside targets and even the six to 12 month upside targets in those metals. I just continue to explain why I thought that late 2022 was a major shift in what I call the uh, 40-year cycle of currency wars and that gold is continuing to gain against all of your fiat currencies, even though the dollar index appears to be holding up its value versus gold continues to decline. And there's been a lot of analysis out there, too, explaining why a lot of this has little to do with the dollar to gold ratio and more to do with buying in in China, even from your your household buying because of their concerns about their own economy, um, buying and demand from other uh, sources and central bank buying continuing. There's just a lot of factors that began to come into play in late 2022, and then after we saw a secondary low in October of 2023, gold and silver were getting primed for the more dynamic portion of their uptrend. And finally, when you had those buy signals triggered in mid-February of this year, it signaled that we were getting ready to enter the third of third wave up, which is when you start expecting accelerated moves each time. So I do think there is still more upside. Uh, right now we're in a little bit of a consolidation after fulfilling the, the latest targets, but uh, I could see a, a subsequent low even this week. Uh, there's some daily cycle lows April 25th, 26th, and uh, we could see the next uh, advance start to unfold in at the very end of April and then early part of May. How does your 17-year cycle analysis for stocks, interest rates, and recessions align? That is a, a large, overriding, overarching cycle that I think is a, a strong uh, reinforcing and uh, corroborating factor in a lot of these markets. And yeah, a couple of months ago, I was elaborating on that 17-year cycle of U.S. recession. And, you know, even before I get into that, I guess I should give a quick recap of this 17-year cycle. It's a very unique, uncanny cycle that I've been writing about since the late 1990s. Uh, At the time, I explained how one phase of that 17-year cycle should come into play in early 2000 in time, a multi-year top in the stock market. But then there was a second kind of overarching or or intervening phase of a 17-year cycle that that came into play in 2007, and that was linked to previous peaks and sell-offs in the stock market that were seen in 1990, 1973, 1956, 1939, each on a very consistent 17-year cycle basis. And it was just kind of um, ironic to me, a little one of those uh, aha or chuckle type of things, that that was the same time that your, excuse me, your 17-year cicadas were coming back to 
uh, to life in the Midwest, where I was living at the time outside of Chicago. And it just kind of intrigued me, and I started doing more and more research on that cycle from a natural standpoint, from a market standpoint. And it was interesting to me as I did a lot of that research, I came upon some uh, research and analysis from an astrophysicist who had done some detailed analysis of the electromagnetic uh, repelling and, and attracting forces between the Earth and the Sun, what he called the two and away movement, and concluded that it was a very consistent 17-year cycle. And so if you think of, you know, all of our emotions and physiology being uh, electromagnetic, it wasn't exactly surprising that you would identify a cycle like that in nature. And then just in the last couple of years, after I've been writing about this cycle for over two decades, uh, they some more research was done on the solar cycle and sunspot cycle and your your standard well recognized sunspot cycle is about 11.2 years between peaks in solar storms and between troughs in solar storms they had in the last 10 or so years identified a second one that was a 40-year cycle, lo and behold, exactly where these these really long-term shifts in society and cultures take place. And, and that was something they called the great conveyor belt to the sun and showed how on a 40-year cycle basis, not only the, the shifting of sunspot and solar storms, but the polarity of those storms and how that impacts uh, Earth and and the, the, the planetary system. But more recently, uh, they did some extensive work and realized that there is a, a second 10 to 20 year cycle, a third major cycle in the sun that has very consistently timed the, the ebb and flow of these sunspots and surprise, surprise, they pinpointed a 17-year cycle on this level, too. So you've got some major, broad, natural electromagnetic. We're all electromagnetic beings, so shifts in, in magnetivity have underlying impacts on us that we don't even recognize. And so even things like aggressive and passive behavior are influenced by that. And you see it in the market. You see it in mass psychology. You see it in in the swings of not only stock markets, but economies as well. So getting back to that topic of the 17-year cycle of U.S. recessions, you can go back to pretty much the beginning of our our, our country and, and move forward on a 17-year basis. And it's not that every recession falls into that, but every 17-year cycle incorporated or encompassed a significant recession, starting with uh, 1785 to 1788 was a recession following the panic of 1785. And funny enough, it led to the demand for stronger federal government back then. 17 years later, you had recession of 1802 to 1804. Then the panic of 1819 led to a depression. And you just, for each 17 years, 1838, 39, the mid-1850s, you had the panic of 1857, <clears throat> and then forward into the early 1900s, uh, 1906, 07, was the panic and crash of 1907 led to a severe monetary contraction and, and really is what led to, a few years later, the founding of the Federal Reserve System. Continuing on that 17-year basis, you got to the mid-50s, late 50s, uh, the recession of 1958. 17 years later, in 74 and 75, you had stagflation, recession, oil crisis, 
1991-92, you had the, the post-Persian Gulf War recession, uh, the one that's sometimes blamed for um, pushing the, the first George Bush out of office. And then, of course, 17 years later, 2008-09, you had the Great Recession following and coinciding with the uh, major sell-off in the stock market. Well, that 17-year cycle comes back into play in 2025-2026, and a lot of indications are we could see a another uh, significant recession in that time frame. But prior to that, you have other... Uh, phases of that 17-year cycle that often lead something like the recession. And I talked about last year, towards the end of 2023, in October, how you had 17-year cycle with interest rates and with real estate extremes were all coming back into play in October 2023, if you got real precise about it. But in that late 2023, early 2024 time frame, and uh, even when you look at the housing affordability index on a very consistent 17-year cycle has, has hit its uh, nadir or its low, and, and it uh, hit that again in late 2023, you had interest rates. Uh, even the Fed funds target on a very consistent basis, 17-year cycle basis, peaking after the last three times, it was after a three-year surge. So in 1989, 2006, and then again in 2023, you had this 17-year cycle impacting interest rates and real estate. All of these things are coming together and, and coinciding with how that cycle has impacted stock markets, and so it all is kind of working together, the synergy there, pinpointing 2024 to begin a, a shift in the stock market and 2025 to really see things kick in where recession, real estate, interest rates, uh, all those factors should come together and, and kind of reinforcing that cycle. But there are a lot of other indicators and more precise, more short-term <clears throat> cycles that I rely on once I have kind of laid out that big, broad picture, that, that sketch of, of what could unfold, uh, start looking at uh, corroborating factors and indicators, and, and they are all starting to line up in that way, too. And even this uh, big shift in in the dollar's underlying value, not not the dollar index again versus other fiat currencies, uh, that's often more just a smokescreen, but the actual underlying value of the U.S. dollar and, and where that's been going and, and how that has an effect on things like inflation, and ultimately recession. So you have a lot of these factors coming together, and they've all been so consistently playing on this 17-year cycle basis that you kind of uh, ignore it at your own peril. Eric, where can listeners get more information on Inside Track and the Weekly Relay? Uh, they can get all of that type of information on our primary website, insidetracktrading.com. And that is inside, spelled with the extra I in the middle. So it's I-N-S-I-I-D-E, tracktrading.com. You can find um, many of our uh, indicator tutorials there. You can find all types of both educational and informational uh, material. But obviously for the current and most updated analysis and trading strategies, that's a subscription-based product that we that we offer. So that's where they can find all of that information. Eric, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. 
Thanks for having me back, Jim. My guest has been Eric Haddock, CEO and President of InsideTrackTrading.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Bob Hoy and Eric Haddock. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from the Director of Marketing for RecycleCo, Tony Mitchell. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. My guest is Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. Tony, welcome back to Company Showcase. Hi, Jim. It's great to be back. How go things in the world of lithium-ion battery recycling? Well, there's a lot of great things going on, Jim. Um, We just announced in our latest press release that the Indian Patent Office has granted an additional patent for the processing of cobaltus sulfate slash, you know, diethanate uh, liquors derived from cobalt. That's quite a mouthful there. Um, But this Indian patent brings the RecyclaCo's global patent portfolio to 15 patents. And we have five additional patent applications related to lithium-ion battery recycling processes filed globally. And this extends our patent portfolio on an important emerging market. And we look forward to adding more in the future. So um, in general, though, all is going along at a nice pace in regards to everything associated with moving Recyclico's Taiwan battery recycling and upcycling joint venture forward. And, uh, you know, I'd love to talk about a few other things that are brewing behind the scenes, but unfortunately, I'm bound by in non-disclosure once again, and we have to leave it for a future podcast. Um, That said, Jim, this week, uh, I'd like to give listeners some context. As we closely follow the world's transition from internal combustion engines to electric-powered vehicles. And it's interesting to note the pace of progress and innovation certainly isn't slacking off in that regard either. Um, You know, ever since Tesla kicked off the EV race in 2011 with their mass-produced Model S, uh, you know, the main concern from naysayers back then and continues to be, What are they going to do with all those end-of-life EV batteries? It's an environmental disaster just waiting to happen. And um, especially back in those early days, no one in the battery industry wanted to address what happens to end-of-life batteries because the default method of dealing with the toxic material in batteries was to burn them. It's, It's crazy to think that was going on back then. But what's even crazier is that even now in 2024, We hear there are still big, well-known recycling companies, I say recycling in air quotes at this stage, uh, burning batteries through a process called pyrometallurgy. While it's a much simpler, cruder solution, I say in air quotes again, to the environmental problem, uh, it requires a huge, huge furnaces and accelerants to fuel them. And they only end up being able to rake off about 10 to 15 percent, if they're lucky, of the original material which then has to be further processed and so on and so on. That doesn't sound like a very environmentally friendly or profitable way to do business. <laughs> no, Jim. Here in 2024, it certainly doesn't at all. However, keep in mind, back then, the battery industry was only too happy to pass this battery waste on to whoever would take it off their hands, you know, out of sight, out of mind. If you were a pyrometallurgical battery recycler, you know, and you didn't have to pay for this waste and could recover 10 to 15 percent of the valuable battery materials within it, you could run a pretty simple growing business. So when we think back to 2016 and when RecycleCo's previous CEO, Larry Ray and Norm Chow from Conecco, began attending battery conferences and giving presentations to the battery industry, about our ability to recover up to 99% of the valuable materials locked within battery waste using our closed-loop patented hydrometallurgical process. Uh, the naysayer said, that's not possible, that's BS. And, you know, and the media and whatnot did the same thing. 
But now, after years of testing with multiple potential joint venture partners, independent third-party reports, uh, you know, features by Sandy Monroe and, and the sort, as battery production facilities and recyclers are finally realizing RecycleCo has a much more efficient process to recover battery materials locked within battery waste. And uh, our partners can then do it on site at their own facilities. They're really thinking about their battery waste and their business models in a whole new way. You see, Jim, ideally, uh, battery producers never want to let go of their production scrap. And OEM EV manufacturers want to recover all of the end-of-life battery materials locked within the batteries inside the vehicles they produce. So upcycling those battery materials for use in the next undoubtedly much more efficient uh, generation of batteries makes a lot of business sense, especially in comparison to mining, you know, uh, virgin materials um, with all the like ecological, logistical, and you know, increasing regulatory challenges that presents. But personally, you know, I, I think because of the circular con- economics of our revolutionary technology, it will radically change the way people approach ownership of an EV, especially as the most expensive part of an EV is the battery pack. I think many, if not most people, will choose to lease a vehicle or essentially pay for access to the latest and greatest EV in the future. Sort of like we do today, you know, with the iPhone model where you pay a monthly fee and get the latest iPhone. After all, when you consider the recyclable process essentially enables battery producers and OEMs to recover and upcycle 99% of the battery materials within their previous generation of products, do this in an infinite number of times for successive generations of products to come, can you realize just how important and valuable our technology is to the future of EVs and all lithium-ion powered products to come? So, Jim, with that in mind, let's just say the timing of getting our first clean spot battery recycling and upcycling plant running couldn't be better as demand for our revolutionary process grows around the world. Tony, where are you traded, and how can people get more information about RecycleCo? Certainly, Jim. Um, we're traded on the TSX Venture under the ticker symbol AMY, on the OTCQB under the ticker symbol AMYZF, and on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol ID4. And you can always get more information on our website at RecycleCo.com. Tony, thank you so much for the update. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on April 25th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.